Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. My name is Andrew Sumner. I'm here with the mighty head book buyer of Forbidden Planet, Laura Dodd. And we are supremely privileged to be joined by the incredible Veronica Roth, the creator of Divergence, all that, all that genre goodness. How are you doing, mate? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. As we've discussed more than once in the last couple of minutes. Yeah, no, all is good. Um, what was the term you used off camera? Chock full of antibodies. Yep, yep. stuffed right full of them. Yeah, <laughs> which is a good thing. Now I, I know I know that Laura's been really looking forward to this interview, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let you bust out of the gate on this one, mate. Well, thank you very much. Um, so congratulations on the tenth anniversary of yeah. the Divergent series. Thanks. I know. God. Um, Can't did you, it. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, did you see this series being so big when you first came up with the idea? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, that would be like uh, the height of delusion, right? Um, <laughs> I, would, I would have loved it if you'd have said, yes, of course, yes. that would have been so good. Mm -hmm. Yes, I orchestrated this yeah. single-handedly. Uh, no, I mean, I thought maybe someone would publish it. That was like the biggest hope that I had. And then um, 10 years later, I mean, I still get messages like, I just read your first book. And then I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> Wait till you get to the third and then you'll hate me. <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, we'll come on to that in a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so you, um, and the new cover art as well is absolutely stunning. Um, did you have any input into the new covers? Yeah, I did. So um, basically it's, it was sort of collaborative. I, I had this, uh, there was a Divergent Movie IMAX poster and they're very artsy, you know, the IMAX posters. And um, I thought like, wouldn't it be great if the covers kind of resembled this? We figured out who the artist was, Victor, no, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say her last name, but um, Victor Nagai, and uh, she's amazing and talented. And my editor was on board and everyone was like happy and she was willing to do it. So it just it was a really wonderful process. I feel like I see something new in them every time I look at them. <laughs> They are, they're almost like magic eye. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah, very, very cool. Her, her work's lovely as well. So beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, you started writing the first book when you were still at university. Um, did the university setting help you come up with the idea for the factions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly the factions uh, at the university, but um certainly like being in sort of intense academic environments helped with them I think because my high school I think my high school was harder um than college for me it was so like academically rigorous and so I think that kind of like high pressure environment is what made me um motivated to write about this like faction of risk-taking lunatics <laughs> <laughs> but the the faction system was more like um like me liking to put things in neat little categories. And I love personality tests and stuff like that. So it was a little like create your own utopia and then watch it go wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think uh, I think you really captured the zeitgeist and continue to do so even though it's 10 years later with the whole um, people taking personal testing and amplifying that into you know the dystopian events that you did um dodd and i were talking about this this afternoon when we were on the on the road up towards interviewing you um our question was what came first for you that the characters or the world building oh man this is always a good question yeah for me i'm like a concept driven writer which i think um is maybe why i gravitate towards science fiction and fantasy and it's, I always hesitate to say that because I feel like the right writer response is like character always. Um, <laughs> but really, like I, I have an idea for kind of a world or something I'd like to explore. And then I try to find the most interesting character inside of that world. So it's definitely like world based, but it can take a long time to figure out who's right to tell the story. Like a, a very early draft of Divergent was from Tobias's perspective. Uh, and he was how I tried to find my way into this story, but he's not the most interesting one to tell the story because I don't know, a young man like leaving a repressive environment and seeking adventure is like all of literature. <laughs> so um, so it, was much, it worked a lot better. It was more interesting if it was like this meek little girl, um, like, I mean, little like in stature. 
Um, so she was the right narrator, but it took me years to find her. Um, did, was there kind of any um, people either in like friends or family or anyone that kind of inspired her at all? Oh, no. I mean, first of all, we're all giants in my family. Um, <laughs> so there's none of that. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't really, um, I think I try to like go into a headspace that I don't understand at first. So the char- my characters don't usually resemble me. And then I feel weird about basing them on anyone else because then, you know, they'll like take offense probably. <laughs> so you need to make a character flawed. <laughs> so you don't want to, uh, you know, insult the people in your life. But um, I do, I find like one or two sort of relatable things. And then I, part of the fun of writing is getting to occupy the headspace of someone who's not like you and who makes different decisions than you would and trying to have empathy for that person. So. <laughs> Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, definitely. Now we ha- we have to touch on uh, w- what you touched on before. Obviously, people still discovering the series. Um, but obviously, when the series first came out, kind of YA was still a new a new kind of genre and, and finding its footing, especially in the UK. Um, and obviously, the, the shocking twists and um, character death. Um, was that always planned? Um and kind of the the mix of I would imagine positive and negative feedback kind of yeah how how was that process (laughs) yeah oh um (laughs) oh boy we'll get into it um it was always planned um and I honestly this is going to sound unbelievable uh but I really thought I had said I had like telegraphed it so hard that it was going to be like not a surprise to anyone and that everyone was going to guess it. That was my paranoia, like in the lead up to Allegiant coming out. I was like, oh no, everyone's going to know because it starts off and it's in two points of view. And so I was like, they're going to get it. No, <laughs> that's not what happened. Um, and so I just, you know, huge miscalculation on my part uh, in terms of like what I was anticipating. <laughs> but um But I think part of the thing when it came out is that everyone had been waiting sort of all together. Like they'd all discovered the series probably when Insurgent came out. That was when the fan base started to grow. And so for a year and a half, they're anticipating like this big conclusion. And then of course, like, you know, it's pretty devastating, which is intended to be. But uh, I do think the collective grief sort of amplified it. And so the initial reaction was really intense. And now, you know, 10 years later, people get kind of spoiled in advance. They, they're a little more, they're less anticipation, like they're, they can read it right away. So I think um, usually the response now is a little more measured and um, maybe even more positive, like overall, which is, (laughs) which is nice. I mean, I don't really care. Like if people like it or don't like it, that's fine. The book is theirs to react to, but, um, (laughs) but I would say that's what I've noticed over time. (laughs) I think that's a very measured and balanced, balanced response, particularly with mm-hmm. your, you know, it, emotional uh, connection to how people react to the books. The fact that they're out there and they belong to others is uh, always a very healthy thing for an author to, to oh, think, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. But um, w- during that a- amazing ride of that, of the, the, the conclusion coming out when it did uh, and that reaction, how did that feel in the moment, given it, it was, given that? did you did you feel a sanguine about it then or was it was it was it quite overwhelming for a time yeah it was overwhelming um first of all like at that point I had an undiagnosed anxiety disorder so uh Ah, it was like you know it hit me all at once and I was like oh I think I need therapy um (laughs) anyway so that was good uh I did go but also I mean I did get a lot of like threats uh at that time so some of them were obviously like hyperbole and some were harder to tell so I think that's the thing people don't understand about the internet is like it's really hard to read you know it's if it's like a teenager being like I'll kill you and um, (laughs) if it's like a person being like no really (laughs) so that was that was really difficult obviously that that has stopped thankfully um but I do think like if you've made a choice that you really stand behind, it's almost easier to, to accept the way people react because it didn't make me like doubt myself. I was like, okay, well, if I can still stand behind it now with all these people yelling at me, then I know that I did the right thing. And that's all you can do. You know, like I, people will read a lot of books in their lifetime, but I will only write, you know, a few and I have to be able to live with them. So for me, like I wasn't 
totally sanguine, <laughs> but I think I did have like a pretty stable feeling about, you know, what I had chosen to do. So, yeah, yeah, that, I think that's very, that makes a lot of sense and is completely healthy. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, according Definitely to me, somebody's that. completely unqualified to make that assessment, but it feels right <laughs> to me. Well, I appreciate it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think as well, I think for me, it was the series stuck with me because I wasn't expecting it and but it was handled so well. And at the time, I mean, now, obviously, people are getting killed off in books left, right and centre. But at the time, it was so shocking. Um, but those books have really stuck with me. So, yeah, you did an amazing job. So. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so from kind of then to to now how has your writing process changed I think I think I read in an interview recently that you say you kind of plan more now so is that something that you kind of had to learn to do yes so I mean when I say that like I always had sort of like a rough plot structure uh for Divergent like the big beats were planned out but a lot of the world building I didn't really even know how little I had thought through um until they started making movies. And then the directors who are like these intense detail oriented people would be like, okay, how does the plumbing work? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I think that really helped like hearing all those questions like about currency and about, you know, like uh, manufacturing stuff like that. Cause they, they want to know like Neil Berger always wanted to know that stuff you know, for stuff they can show in the background or just for a second, like all that stuff becomes really important to them. And I was so like embarrassed that I didn't know that I was like, never again. So um, all of my world building has become a lot more rigorous since that series came out, especially with my most recent book, Chosen Ones, which is for an adult audience. You know, we make those distinctions, they don't really matter, but um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, it's also set in Chicago. And so going back into the city and being like, okay, well this time I want it to feel real and not like a dream Chicago. Um, so it was just like a lot more research and a lot more knowing what to think through, knowing what kinds of questions you should know how to answer even if they don't end up on the page. Um, and you know, you learn by experiencing. So I'm not trying to be too hard on Divergent but it has been 10 years. So hopefully yeah. I've grown, you know. <laughs> How, um, how did you feel about the oh sorry Dottie, we're probably going to say oh, no, the same no, thing no, which no. Is, yeah you, you go <laughs> which is probably uh, how did you feel about the ride you went on with the movies and because you had a very in, you had a very interesting quite unique experience with with seeing your work adapted yeah it was uh it was quite a ride and um the first one was very different from the other two because the first one was uh shot in chicago where i live so um i got to kind of like ride the train walk off, get on set. It was like the world changed around me because the, you know, they'd cover up all this, the signs for everything and then make everything look kind of dirty because <laughs> it was like dystopian, but it's still Chicago. So it was totally wild and, um, and really fun. And then the subsequent ones were shot in Atlanta, which is, you know, a lot farther from me. So I didn't get to go as often. And they also became more like more sci-fi as they went um, under Robert Schwenke's like direction. And so um, they got a little farther from the books, but I mean, regardless, it's still really interesting to see everybody do their jobs behind the scenes, like this army of people who are working to make the best work that they can, like production design and costumes and props and um, all these people are just so incredibly good at their work. So that was really the most valuable and the most inspiring thing about it for me. The story changes, you know, sometimes they were good and sometimes they weren't, um, but as far as just getting to watch all these people do such such like detailed and excellent work, like, man, I would never trade it. It was so, so cool. Yeah. And such a such an amazing period of time in your life to to encounter that as well. I mean, most people spend, you know, 20 years, you know, putting their books together and to, hoping against hope that things are going to get adapted. And, you know, you'll, right. you'll bang straight out the gate. I, I think that must have been a fascinating experience. Yeah, it was pretty wild. I mean, it's hard to start off that way because you're like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess we did all that. Now what? Um, it's a good problem to have, but it was still a little, like it was a lot to take in um, now or then and, and now. Um, 
And I don't know, I remember telling myself in the moment, I was like, this will probably never happen to you again. So you better really drink it in. So at least I had that awareness. It wasn't like I took it for granted even then. I was just like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> can't believe this. It's wild. <laughs> And have you ever um, thought about um, other adaptations? Because there's obviously at, at the moment uh, lots of kind of comic adaptations happening, as well as kind of doing the whole Netflix, Netflix like Grishaverse and all that amazing stuff. Do you think you'd ever want to kind of look at those avenues? Yeah, I mean, um, sort of always working on it actually behind the scenes. So the rights to Chosen Ones are, are with a production company called Picture Start. So we're, you know, working on it, um, but it, it really is hard to have everything come together. So um, you can have like a bunch of frying pans and a bunch of fires for like a long time and nothing will ever come of them or, or maybe something will come of them 10 years later. Like it's just hard to, it's hard to say. So um, certainly it would be really fun to happen again but you know mostly I focus on on writing books and stories so I try not to go completely bananas with stuff I can't control <laughs> speaking of which Veronica what are you working on at the moment Ooh, um, <laughs> I'm at that really annoying stage where I can't really talk about oh it. man this um, happens to us so often that uh, yeah, no, we're, yeah, we're totally I'm used sorry. to it. <laughs> but I am writing um I, I had chosen ones which I've mentioned came out just last year at the first week of lockdown. So it was like a terrible <laughs> time for a book to come out, but we did our best. Um, everybody behind the scenes rallied. So that was the, it was an interesting year. So I think I'm kind of reeling from that still, but um, yeah, my next book will be for, for grownups as, yeah. as the last one was. That's good. That's, um, good. That's very, a very specific answer, which I respect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And I know, I know that Dodd, you had a sanity-based question, didn't you, mate? Uh, yes, of course. So um, it's been really interesting to see what's kind of kept people sane during lockdown. So, is there anything you have watched, played, read that's kind of you know kept you in the game? Yeah, a couple things. So um, I chose a really bad time to replay Mass Effect. <gasps> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I love those games so much, but I didn't know they were like coming out with a new edition of it this year. So I played it last year. I was Damn. like, all right, well, well I think I'm playing it again, but um, I'll play as a renegade, which is really hard because uh, you have to make some like horrible decisions as a renegade. Anyway, I don't want to get into the weeds with it. Um, you, I also you magically buried... said exactly the right thing for Dodd, by the way. She's oh, yeah. a, a yeah. huge oh, Mass Effect fan. Yeah. Oh my God, yes. I love those games. They're so <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, but yeah, I also got really into tennis. Wow. Uh, and I'm not like a, I know that's completely the other way. Um, and I don't watch sports. I'm not one of those people who is into sports, but yeah, I got obsessed with it. It created a whole narrative in my mind for all these people. And now I watch all the, even the small tournaments, it's ridiculous. So that's how I stay insane. Did, did, did you play as well? Were you, were, you, were you playing just literally as a visual experience? Yes, yeah. I only ever played volleyball because I'm so tall. It's like a requirement. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I'm not coordinated. So, <laughs> Veronica, how tall are you, mate? Uh, I mean, I only know in feet, but yeah, I'm six yeah. feet tall. Oh yeah, so I, I would only understand in feet as well. Oh wow, I've got him. I've got him, mate. Yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> I've got a certain wing of my family, not my immediate bit, because I'm very short. Um, well, five foot eight is not that at all. But my, I've got a bunch of cousins, uh, all of whom are female, and all of whom are in the police force, and all of whom are your height. So yeah, wow. Yeah. All so cousins. so yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, big tall cousins. Yeah. I'm the shortest um, one in my family. So. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess if you've got, you know, uh, if you male members of your family are even taller, right? That you know, isn't it a statistic? Isn't there some kind of genetic thing where? Oh man, I'm trying to remember what it is. Oh, I don't know what it is. It's male children always have to be taller than their mother. That's it, right? Is that the way it works? Really? Yeah, yeah. No, male children are, are, are never shorter than their own mother. Wow. So, yeah, well, I guess that's fact. true in my family. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think it's true of everybody. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how I know this. You know, it's not, know not even a subject that I've, I've researched <laughs> or anything. I've got a feeling one of my tall cop cousins might have told me that and i just believe them because they have that <laughs> herbal authority yeah, i mean it sounds right 
yeah, yeah. It does doesn't it right yeah exactly yeah. there you go there you go and, and veronica in terms of what you you read personally what kind of genres speak to you you know, you, you know when you're reading on your own time um, I mean, I mostly read science fiction and fantasy, so I'm, I'm pretty committed, you know, I'm not, I don't deviate a whole lot. Um, every so often I'll read a mystery. <laughs> That's probably it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think most recently I read Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro, um, which was so, so good. Yeah, so it's wonderful. Uh, so, so Don, it's that time we've raced towards the end of our time together, Veronica, but I know Don has one final parting question for you. Yes, I do. And as, as the shortest girl on the basketball team, that was my claim to fame. Um, so um, from your recent Instagram pics, um, I saw you posting some old photos of you posing in different factions. So which faction are you? Oh, man, my answer to this keeps evolving. So I feel like a fraud. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, it's like, how do you feel that day? Or, you know, what, where are you at in your journey of self-discovery? So um, I know that where I came from, like my family would be a candor family. Oh, is super honest to the point of like insulting you without meaning to. <laughs> um, so that's where I came from. But I, uh, I always have trouble with this. Um, I think these days I would choose erudite. I'm feeling a lot of like apologism for them. Um, I think they don't come off well in the series. And, <laughs> but I, I'm increasingly coming around to the idea that curiosity is like one of the most important qualities that a person can have and that it makes you kinder and, um, and gentler toward the world. So uh, I've tried to foster that in myself. So I think maybe that's why I would choose it. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> that is a wonderful answer and a beautiful point uh, to, to exit on actually. And so you have been watching Forbidden Planet TV. Uh, I'm Andrew Summers, this is Laura Dodd, and we have been privileged to be joined by the supremely talented Veronica Roth, the architect author of the Divergent series, which is out in an amazing uh, series of new covers, which you can order from the links attached to this conversation. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, mate. Yeah, it's really been lovely you. to meet you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Take care, <laughs> bye-bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.